Good afternoon. My name is David Littman, and I'm a senior research analyst at CAMRA's Education Institute. Today's event is focused on a topic that many of you have expressed deep interest and deep concern over the years, that of Middle East studies in higher education. Before I introduce our esteemed guest today, Neetu Arnold, who has written extensively and thoughtfully on this subject, I would like to take a moment to set the stage for just how big of a problem some of these Middle East Studies departments have truly become. To borrow the words of Asaf Ramorowski and Alex Jaffe, who have also written on the subject, few trends in academia are more depressing than the continued domination of Middle Eastern Studies departments by post-colonial professors whose shtick involves recycling cliched attacks on the United States as the Great Satan and Israel as the Little Satan. Later on this year, Camera will be publishing two reports on the activities of a specific Middle East Studies department at an Ivy League school. One, which my brilliant colleagues Ricky Hollander and David Orenstein are working on, will focus on how the department is working to embed anti-Israel and anti-Semitic propaganda into K-12 education. The other report, which I will be working on, or have been working on, will focus on the direction that department has taken toward embracing a particularly disturbing form of what they call Palestinian studies. I spent five years covering the hate-filled United Nations, but the rhetoric I have found being used at this university about Jews and about the state of Israel has shocked even me. To give you some examples, we have found one professor on video telling students that there are, quote, Jewish mobs, a phrase he interchangeably used with Kristallnacht mobs in an effort to liken Jews to their Nazi tormentors that were, quote, thirsty for Palestinian blood. Other professors and speakers have worked to deny Jewish peoplehood, declaring, for example, that Jewish history is just, quote, ancient mythology. Through their obsessive application of critical theory, they declare that Jews cannot be Jews. They can only be Europeans. They can be Arab Jews, or they can even be Muslim Jews who have oppressed their Muslim identity, but they cannot be their own people, and thus they cannot have the right to self-determination. Entire courses and multiple events at this university have focused on turning the fight against anti-Semitism into a conspiracy theory. Students are being taught that there's no real evidence of growing anti-Semitism problems. Rather, they are being taught that claims to the contrary are a neo-colonial conspiracy used to justify measures that purportedly combat anti-Semitism, but which are truly sinister measures designed to advance colonialism and prevent Palestinians from enjoying their right to commit terrorism against Jewish civilians. This Middle East Studies Department is also rife with extremism. Terror organizations are openly glorified. As U.S. designated terror organizations like Hamas indiscriminately launched thousands of rockets towards Israeli civilian population centers in May 2021, students were being taught by one professor that Hamas was just fighting for the rights of those who want to pray at Al-Aqsa Mosque. Events have even depicted women's rights campaigners as, quote, supremacist toxic feminists simply for not supporting Palestinian terrorism and have vilified them for, quote, gruesome sensationalism about sexual slavery under ISIS rather than talking about the, quote, costs of war in Iraq. These are the messages that are being taught at just one of, these nation, of this nation's many Middle East Studies centers. And as a scholar Martin Kramer has said, Middle East, Stutter, Middle East Studies matters not because of what the academics say or write, but because of what they teach. Which brings me to our guest today, Neetu Arnold, who has looked at the problem of Middle East Studies across a number of universities. Neetu Arnold is a graduate of Cornell University. She is the author of Hijacked, The Capture of America's Middle East Studies Centers which will be the subject of today's conversation and which I encourage everybody to read, as well as Outsourced to Cutter, 
and Priced Out, What College Costs America. She has been published in the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and City Journal, among other outlets. And before I hand it over, I would like to encourage the audience to post any questions they might have on this subject, as we will be having a Q&A portion at the end. Neetu, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here today, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time. The floor is all yours. David, thank you so much. And hearing what you just said about what is happening at these centers, I was quite shocked to hear some of the things you were saying. So I really appreciate the work your organization is also doing on this topic and providing the necessary information so that the public can make uh, better informed decisions on this topic. And so I look forward to the report that your organization is going to produce soon. The topic of Middle East study centers is quite interesting and an area that has attracted controversy in modern times. But the American discipline of Middle East studies, uh, Middle East, can be traced back to colonial times. Harvard taught Semitic and Arabic languages for biblical purposes. Other, other events that contributed to increased interest in the region across time include uh, churches here in America launching missionary trip missionary trips into the Arab world, archaeological expeditions that led to groundbreaking discoveries, and the Western world striking oil. But the robust structure of Middle East study centers and departments really took place following World War II, when the American government recognized that its citizens needed a more robust education in modern world affairs. During the 1950s, uh, phil philanthropic foundations, multinational corporations, the U.S. government, and various interested scholars uh, came together and established the first Middle East study centers at American colleges with a focus on modern affairs to produce policy-relevant information for the purposes of national security. These centers quickly attracted controversy. Following the Six-Day War and the Yom Kippur Wars, both in the 60s and 70s, um, whose outcomes turned significantly upon American diplomatic and military support for Israel, wealthy Arab nations realized that these centers could be useful and influential tools for American policy in the region. Now, Americans raised concerns of foreign influence as centers such as those at Georgetown started to accept funds, massive funds, from Arab nations. And it's these concerns over foreign influence, anti-Western and anti-Israel bias in instruction that has continued to generate much of the interest in these centers. Next slide. Oh, the next slide. Thank you. Um, so our organization, the National Association of Scholars, which we're interested in education reform, and we produce a lot of um, research into various uh, issues and in, into education, we wanted to provide an up-to-date account of these centers. We particularly wanted to explore what these centers were promoting today, um, whether uh, Middle East centers and specifically national resource centers, which are funded by the federal government, were affected by foreign funds. And so a lot of my uh, presentation today will be focusing um, on one aspect of the research. So there were two things we did. Uh, there was a more qualitative aspect of the research, which was uh, looking into several universities, providing in-depth case studies, interviews with administrators, professors, and students, and actually going through the course material and their outreach programs. And so we provide a detailed account in our report. And then there's a portion that I haven't really seen done anywhere else, and it was providing um, data analysis over Middle East National Resource Centers. So uh, if you're interested in the in-depth case studies, I would recommend visiting the National Association of Scholars website, which as you can see on this slide, you can visit our website, the link is there. Uh, you can click the tab which says 
uh, reports and projects, and then look for the hijacked uh, symbol or hijacked title and then the uh, pretty picture with the sun below. And uh, you can read the full report there. Um, but for this presentation, I'm focusing more on the data analysis. And that's because um, one of the strengths of this kind of broad analysis is it allows us to make generalizations across uh, various centers. Uh, this is specifically for Middle East National Resource Centers and not necessarily those that don't receive federal funds. Um, I think this is so crucial because it can show us trends that occur at multiple universities. And there are over 50 uh, Middle East and Islamic centers in the country. And for one person to look at all of them, that that's a little bit, uh, it, you know, it, it may be unrealistic for one person to do that, but we can get a lot of information just by looking at the National Resource Centers and the trends that have occurred um, between 2000 and now. Um, and after doing this research, I learned that there is really a lot of prime opportunities here for policy reform, specifically at the government level. And I think that's so important as we discuss ways to move forward to um, curb the bias that is there at these centers, the influence that they exert, not only in higher education, but at the K through 12 level. Uh, next slide. So, Middle East National Resource Centers. So National Resource Centers receive federal funds These um, through Title VI of the Higher Education Act. They were established through the National Defense in Education Act of 1958, and the purpose was to bolster national security. At the time, uh, the United States was lacking uh, foreign language and cultural knowledge of various areas of the world. And so the government believed that it was crucial, if not a national emergency, to ensure that Americans were becoming knowledgeable in foreign languages and uh, the relevant cultures of those regions for national security purposes. As you'll see in this graph, Im immediately after national resources, resource centers were founded, um, they received a lot of federal support. Um, and then shortly after, in, in the early 70s, the support drops because there was decreased interest in these centers. Um, and actually the Nixon administration had even considered cutting uh, the funds to national resource centers altogether, um, but that didn't really come to fruition. So over time, the funds to these centers have increased. Um, and today, these funds support 10 international education and foreign language studies grants programs. Uh, when it came to the methodology of um, looking into these centers, we relied on information from the International Resource Information System Database. I like to call it IRIS. It is part of the Department of Education. And the IRIS database collects um, information from all kinds of national resource centers that focus on various regions of the world. We're going to be focusing on Middle East studies, but there, there are area studies that focus on like Asia and South America and Africa and so forth. Um, and in this database, it contains information on um, instructional materials, uh, outreach programs, you know, the kinds of programs they are con uh, conducting, um, grant information, the amount of funds. So it's a very useful um, database that exists. Next slide. So across the 14 Middle East National Resource Centers that exist, the average center today receives about $260,000 in federal funds. And this has remained pretty constant from around two, 2014 to now. Um, I think this uh, graph here actually tells an interesting story because uh, there is a lot of interest in Middle East uh, centers during the early 2000s, right after 9-11. Uh, the government was interested more in um, terrorism and combating it and uh, national security. And so funding went 
up immediately after 9-11. And then it slowly decreased. And it was also during this time where there were, again, concerns about what was being taught in these centers, how they were biased towards America, towards Israel, and uh, towards the West. And uh, you're going to start to see a decrease in funds around 2010. Now, there are multiple reasons for this, which we go over in the report. A couple of those reasons include just a delayed response uh, to the uh, 2008 recession, so funding decreased. And then there's also an increased interest in just K through 12 um, education, so funds were allocated as such. But thanks to lobbying in 2013 by those who were interested in the National Resource Centers in general, which included proponents of Middle East studies, uh, funding went back up to what we currently have, which is 260,000. Next slide. Now, when Middle East studies receive these federal funds, it's usually broken down into a budget. And so a bulk of the funds go to fund a small number of staff. So 60% of the total budget goes to fund salaries and fringe benefits for administrative staff who support the day-to-day -day operations of the center. And this is, uh, this is represented in the orange in this graph. Um, now, National Resource Center affiliated faculty receive their salaries from other departments or named professorships. Another large area of funds goes to a, a, a category here called other. It's a little vague. It's here in pink. And we can safely infer that these funds go to support events and other activities at the centers, along with the supplies, as that is one of the National Resource Center's main purpose. Next slide. So Middle East National Resource Centers produce uh, instructional materials and outreach programs for the university and the surrounding community. And so when we looked at the intended audience of instructional materials, uh, we saw that a major target audience here were K through 12 educators. And it's, it's become increasingly important over the years. When you look at uh, back in 2000, only 40% of the instructional materials were set aside for K through 12 educators. And over time, it's grown to over 70% uh, over by the end of the 2010s decade. Now, meanwhile, when you look at the instructional materials um, um, targeted towards higher education, um, it's dipped slightly be below 40%. Next slide. Now, much of the instructional materials focus on curricula. And again, the primary uh, target audience here are K through 12 educators. Uh, 60 to 70% of curriculum materials are meant to be used in the K through 12 classroom. And in our research, this is where we documented that a lot of this curriculum is meant to quote, decenter Western and American culture. And so I'm going to share a few of the things that we have found. And of course, again, if you go to our report, you'll find more examples of this. But when we went through the curriculum and the toolkits, uh, we found some sources. For example, one of the toolkits pointed students to a video on Edward Said's Orientalism, um, which has made a huge impact in the field. And it was by an account called Invicta Palestina on YouTube. Um, Invicta in Latin means invincible or unconquered. A uh, second example of this would be UT Austin's Middle East National Resource Center. Along, It, it was a partnership with other area studies at the university. They hosted a teacher training seminar uh, where they taught teachers to unlearn patterns of whiteness in literacy teaching. And if you're asking, how does that have anything to do with national security? I don't have a good answer for you on that. But these are just a few of the examples 
of the programs that are present at these centers. And it, it just goes to show that there is bias that is creeping in. And given that these are programs that that are funded by the government, greater oversight of Title VI recipients are needed. Uh, next slide. Now, the other types of initiatives National Resource Centers support are outreach programs. Um, and the target audience for outreach programs are typically um, the higher education community, uh, followed by the general public. Um, the second group to follow following higher ed and the public are is again K through 12. And outreach programs that are targeted to K through 12, it, these programs are not necessarily directly engaging with students. They are often aimed at educators through activities like professional development. Next slide. Okay. Um, so Middle East National Resource Center programming are often responsive to current events. And so we actually had the opportunity using a special model to try to predict uh, which outreach programs are more indicative of, um, of uh, earlier programming. So those from the 2000s and those that were uh, much later. And you can... It, the process is a little complicated to uh, describe, but you can look at the methodology again in our study on the NAS's website. But essentially, we took program titles and there were certain words that were associated with earlier years versus later. Um, and so the words that were most predictive of earlier programs included terrorism, Iraq, Af Afghanistan, Islam. And this makes a lot of sense since much of the focus was on the aftermath of September 11th, the war on terror, and so forth. Now, the words that were more predictive of later programs, I right here you can see COVID, uh, which just goes to demonstrate that these programs are highly, uh, they, they are following current events uh, pretty closely. But other words that were reflective of later programming included MENA, which stands for Middle East, North Africa. Uh, that is a newer um, initiative that the that the centers have taken to incorporate aspects of North Africa that are similar with Middle Eastern culture and religion. Uh, we also see refugee and Islamophobia. And so there there's a shift here. It reflects that the issues are more global in nature, and these centers are expanding the scope of what constitutes the Middle East. And so, oh, and I should also mention that I, I'm not so surprised to see a word like refugees here because it was it was during the 2010s where there was also a time of increased immigration of um, Muslims into European countries. Next slide. Uh, what we were also able to do was we could take a closer look at these shift in, the, the shift in focus across topics of interests um, with our research. And so kind of to briefly explain this process, um, I essentially created a dictionary of terms related to um, these relevant topics for Middle Eastern social and political issues. Um, and so, for example, for um, topics related to terrorism, we looked for words such as, you know, terrorism, terrorist, jihad, jihadis. And we also included um, words that were misspelled because uh usually humans are uh, inputting this data and so there can be mistakes, but we wanted to make sure we could capture all of this information through the out outreach program titles. And the purpose of this kind of analysis, it shouldn't necessarily be taken precisely, but it is it, it does show us the trend in what kinds of topics these centers are focusing on. And so for the purposes of this presentation, 
I will be focusing on topics of terrorism, the Israel and Palestine conflict and immigration. Um, we did look at other topics such as feminism, climate change, and that's included in the larger report. So when we look at uh, Middle East National Resource Center's outreach programs related to terrorism, we see that in the early 2000s, uh, the, the programs related to terrorism peaked in 2001, 9-11, and then rapidly declined to less than 0.5% of all outreach programs across all the Middle East National Resource Centers. Um, and some factors that are contributing to this decline include the fact that many academics who are working at these centers who wanted to move away from the topic of terrorism, and they really wanted to focus more on 9-11's negative effects on Muslims. Um, and again, at these centers, I think a lot of the faculty, they didn't really like that 9-11 um, was sort of taking over uh, what they were teaching. Um, next slide. The next issue we looked into is uh, topic coverage of Israel and Palestine issues in outreach programs. Um, I think what was interesting and kind of shocking to me to see here was that there was a general downward trend. So there was less focus on Israel and Palestine, Palestine related issues over time. Um, again, in the early to mid 2000s, um, coverage was at 10% of all outreach programs, and then it dropped over time to 4%. Uh, now, some of the things that could be some of the things that could be uh, that could explain this is that public interest in the issue of Israel versus Palestine has decreased as the conflict in the region has also decreased. Um, and this is an explanation that has been used by some scholars to explain declining coverage of um, Israel and Palestine in American news outlets. Uh, next slide. Now, one particular area that saw an increased interest in issues related to immigration or issue, um, sorry, uh, one area that saw an increase in interest uh, and it differs from what we saw in the other two slides was issues related to immigration. Uh, when you look at this graph, 1% uh, of programs focused on immigration issues in the 2000s. Then it peaks at 4% in 2015, and then it drops back to 2%. Now, the 2% is still double that of what was there in the 2000s. And so this is, again, corresponding to the level of interest in immigration issues, um, especially uh, around 2015 with the European refugee crisis that year. Um, so just to summarize uh, what we've kind of gone over here, um, these trends demonstrate that these centers are highly responsive to current events, and programs are often used to weigh in on controversial issues. Um, these trends, along with our detailed case studies, show how centers approach these kinds of issues. And again, uh, for example, sticking to the topic of immigration, centers typically promote a progressive view on immigration. Uh, when we looked into Yale's Middle East Studies Center, they they had hosted a another training institute for local public school teachers in the New Haven region, and they were they provided a recommendation list of books for their classrooms. And when it came to immigration, these books often promoted um, more liberal views on immigration, relaxed border policies. And there weren't any books that presented the opposing view. And this kind of practice pretty much prevails for the other subjects, which we've covered here. And like, for example, terrorism is usually watered down or it shifts to more cultural discussions. Um, Israel-Palestine issue typically sides more with the Palestinians. And, and uh, it's often... and. and uh, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the fact that there isn't a balanced 
view or they're not providing sources that are fair to both sides means that um, kids, especially since this is um, going to kids, this is eventually going to uh, funnel down to children. They're really just hearing one side of everything. And when you hear that over and over and over again, it that's all they know. And they don't know about the other side. And so that can especially be, be a problem, especially when these centers are receiving public funds. Next slide. Oops, sorry, I dropped some water. Now, the other question uh, we set out to explore was how much do Middle East centers receive in foreign funds today? Um, we know that in the past they've received quite a few funds from various nations, and we wanted to see if that was still a pattern today. Now, this was a little bit harder to investigate, and one of the reasons is because many of these centers, especially the ones at public institutions, uh, they will funnel their funds to the university foundations, and the foundations are, are considered separate from the university, even though these foundations' um, main, uh, main group that they're supporting is the university. But we filed public records requests to try to understand um, how many funds are going to the universities, who's funding them. And this was often a very difficult thing to find. Uh, but luckily, we were able to get the University of California at Los Angeles's um, information uh, from 2000 to 2020, 2001 to 2020. And uh, so at UCLA, uh, private individuals gave the bulk of the funds over the past 20 years. Um, now, I want to go into that a little bit more because there's more to that story. The majority of the private funds came from one donor who was affiliated with the center and she had given $500,000 in 2017. Uh, gifts from private individuals are otherwise usually much smaller. And at UCLA, uh, the average was around $100, though the lowest recorded gift was around $20. Uh, foreign governments accounted for the next bulk of donations at a, uh, at more than $400,000 um, during this time period. Now, these donations primarily came from the Emirate of Abu Dhabi, um, though it was, it was interesting. When I was going through the files, the university actually listed this country under the nonprofit organization category. But... The, the two donations from this country both occurred in 2002, and it totaled $300,000. And these funds were meant to go towards programming and research. Um, so we can say that UCLA's Middle East Studies Centers has not received a lot of funds from foreign donors as of today. We we don't have any information on whether they've received it today, but they did receive foreign funds in the the past. Again, it's a lot harder, though, to say if other um, other centers are receiving foreign funds. Um, private schools might act. Private and elite schools are more likely to attract those kinds of funds uh, just because of their standing. But again, it's usually hard to track this information down because um, just due to shoddy reporting uh, requirements on the part of universities. Um, and just to give an example of this, uh, I actually learned that the University of North Carolina's Middle East Studies Center, which is, uh, it's actually a consortium with Duke University, um, they had actually received a significant amount of funding from Turkey, uh, in the early 2010s, and that was never reported to the Department of Education. So we do know that there are some funds that are going to these universities, they did at some point, but we don't know if that is still the case today. And actually what I'm doing right now at the NAS is trying to find out that information by filing public records requests and trying. we're trying to get as much information as possible. Next slide. Now, I think something that was interesting to learn was looking at uh, 
kind of looking, kind of comparing what happens with public funds versus private funds. And in this case with UCLA, it, it shows why universities might prefer government funding. Uh, government funds offer more stability, whereas private funds, it's highly volatile. And as you can see in this graph, there are times where UCLA receives a lot of funding uh, and from, from private donations and what they're able to bring in through private donations often exceeds that of what's coming from uh, from public funds. But it only happens um, at certain points in time. Whereas when you look at the yellow line, which which is Title VI funds, that that's actually a lot more stable. And I think it just goes to show that with private funds, it, it can be volatile. If you are lucky to get those funds, if you're lucky to know the right people, then it can offer a lot of support for those departments and centers. But government funding essentially offers a, a sense of security in the funds. And so, and, and you can actually see like it's around, uh, I would say the mid 2010s, uh, there was a time where UCLA stopped accepting Title VI funds, and it was during that same time that they received more than five hundred thousand dollars in, uh, or sorry, six hundred thousand dollars in uh, private funds, um, and so they actually exceeded what they were getting in public funds. Um, but it goes, it just goes to show that universities have the ability to raise the funds if there is interest at their uh, among their constituents. And if they don't, then they're probably going to have trouble maintaining those departments or centers. Next slide. So there's so many implications from our data data analysis. We first see that centers are shifting away from national security issues to those of social and cultural topics, and they're often from a progressive perspective, as our case studies and examples show. And so, given that these, given that there's continuing to be bias present at these centers. Um, and they're shifting away from national security relevant topics, which was kind of the purpose of Title VI funds. Um, there's a case to be made that American taxpayer dollars should not be funding these centers. And, and that's because these centers were created out of a sense of a national emergency. But one thing to remember is that emergencies have an end date. And so by removing federal funds from not only Middle East, National Resource Centers, but I, I actually say that we should remove it from all of them since they often work together. It will weaken these centers, the kinds of resources they have to work with, and essentially they have to put in the work to raise the funds and to convince university administration for why their departments should exist. Thank you.